the idea of divine inspiration and suddenly I got the idea and I, I create art. I work a lot with artists. I'm doing two catalogs right now for the Toronto International Art Fair. When I go into an artist's studio, it's like going into somebody else's gym. I mean, they are working their tails off. So, it's discipline is the name of the game. And that would have an impact. You know, uh, late, absent, uh, cell phones, texting, and you know, it's amazing some of the devices. People would have their winter coats, and then, then you'd, see, you'd see the little light underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I, I think you have. Yes. Um, it's sort of reminding me of like Waldorf schools. Hmm. You know, I, I'm not familiar with them. I've heard them, but I must confess I don't know that system. But did you want to follow up on that? Well, just like your methods totally remind me of high school I went to. It's like Waldorf. And Okay, okay. Where did you go to high school? Vancouver. Good show. And it was a good experience? Yeah, it was a good experience. Well, I, like, I started in public school and then I failed. Yeah, so I went to Walter and it was like awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I mean, as you hear me say in, in the film there, I believe there's a treasure inside each one of you. So that the real goal of education is to create a space where you can discover the riches within. Now, this gentleman asked me about anonymity. Two weeks ago, and about the, the names, giving themselves a name, I believe one of the purposes of university education is to permit each learner a.k.a. student, to articulate their own identity. And that's why I invited them to give themselves their own name. What defines you as a person? And if you want to know the theoretical basis behind this, I encourage you to read Angela Davis's Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, The Power of Naming. And particularly as a religious studies scholar, we know full well that naming is in a way of appropriating. It's a very powerful tool. And so how can you appropriate your own identity? And I'd like to give you an example. Two weeks ago, I was at the University of Calgary, and I was guest teaching four classes, two of them with native and non-native students. Two of them only with native students. And I learned so much from them. First of all, I learned that I, I aimed too low. I should have aimed much higher with them. And why did I, why did I realize this? Because many of these young native students have so much lived experience. And while in Western education, understandably, we appeal to reason, why not appeal to their lived experience? And why not appeal to their imagination? And they have imagination and lived experience in spades. So I knew that because we were with native students, that in, in indigenous cultures, um, each nation, people, has a totem. Um, each tribe has, they have a totem, and they have spirit names. So I invited all of them to give themselves a spirit name. As a religious studies scholar, that particularly interests me. And then, two days later in the class, I read out anonymously, and I, I did because I was guest teaching, I didn't know the students, and I didn't know their given names. 
Um, and so I read out some of the spirit names they had given each other. And one of them uh, gave himself a name, and it so struck me that I asked each of the native students in that class, what would you say to so-and-so? And what would you say to so-and-so? And then the class ended, and they walked out of the classroom, and in native culture, um, they're, out of respect, there's very little eye contact. And I was trying to connect, in my westernized way, I was trying to connect with them, trying to communicate to them. And there was one individual who walked by, and I mean, it was like, I couldn't get through. And they walked out. And so then I cleaned up the classroom. And all of a sudden, I noticed that this person was right outside the door. I didn't know what, maybe they were waiting for someone else. And then they walked back in. And very sheepishly, shyly approached me and said, Professor Cornette, could I have back one of the pieces of writing that I did? And I had filed everything that, uh, that they had written for the different subjects we were dealing with in the class. I said, sure. Uh, what was the subject? Spirit name. I said, well, what's your spirit name? Here's what they wrote. Spirit name. Broken. I've been broken all my life. No childhood, innocence, or spirit. Each time it rebuilds, it's broken once again. My life is <coughs> broken. I don't trust anyone. I resent my family over something they had control of. My heart's been broken. Those that died and ones who cheated. In the future, I will still be broken because I must continuously break down walls to allow others in. Those I love will continue to die. There is no end to my broken cycle. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to understand the conditions of native peoples in this country, I encourage you to think about what this young, this person is your age. And all the, you know, one of the reasons I started to work a lot with Aboriginal peoples is as an intellectual, I was uncomfortable with the abstract Aboriginal, the theoretical Indian. Why don't we meet them? talk to them, dialogue with them, invite them. I taught on a campus where Kanastaki is 45 miles away, 45 kilometers away, and Ganawaga is 30 kilometers away. What are we doing treating natives as though they were on the other side of the universe? They are at our doorstep, and they are our fellow citizens in this country. And you know what this person told me after they wrote it down? They said, Professor Cornell, I didn't know I could write that well. That is hope. That's what we're here for. Despite all that she has lived, look at the promise that lies within. So let's create a space where they can bear down and dig deep from within. One of the dialogue partners I've had the privilege of collaborating with is Antonine Maillet. 